small blind versus big blind scenarios are arguably one of the most common yet least studied spots in poker. The ranges are extremely wide and many tough spots can come up. Today we'll take a deep dive into the theory of blind versus blind play in MTTs. Before we get started with this video, just a quick reminder to please go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button so we can keep bringing you more of this content on YouTube. Hi Wizards, I'm Matt Hunt and this video is going to cover all the fundamentals of blind versus blind play in tournaments. It's a very complex topic with a lot of different angles to cover, so let's dive right in. To start with, we're going to look at some of the theoretical principles underpinning blind versus blind situations, since these spots are different from playing outside the blinds, and they're also different from regular heads up play. Then we're going to identify four key nodes of the preflop game tree on which we're going to focus our analysis. The initial node where action folds around to the small blind, the node where the small blind limps and the action is on the big blind, the subsequent node where the small blind limps and the big blind raises, and finally the node where the small blind raises and the big blind is defending. At each node we're going to look at the primary strategies we'll be employing in chip EV terms, and then take a glance at how ICM pressure is going to influence that node in particular. In that part of the discussion we'll be referencing the concept of risk advantage, which I introduced in a previous video on this channel. I encourage you to go back and watch that one if you haven't already. Finally, we'll be taking a look at how post-flop strategies are built in three of the most common scenarios. Limped pots, raised pots with the small blind opening, and raised pots with the small blind limp calling versus a big blind raise. But first, let's focus on some of the key theoretical principles in play. One of the most important aspects about blind versus blind play is that while the big blind does possess an inherent positional advantage, that advantage does not scale in a purely linear fashion. This graph shows the EV of each player in a nine-handed game with roughly 2.6 big blinds in the pot when it folds around to the small blind. You can see that the big blind is winning between about 60 and 70% of the pot at all stack sizes, which is approximately what we might expect. The two players are playing heads up, but one is guaranteed to be out of position, so that's a pretty big disadvantage. However, an interesting trend occurs with the EVs of the two players. While the small blind's EV is higher at shallower stacks, as we would expect, since it's easier for them to realize equity in any post-flop scenario, the big blind's advantage does seem to hit a ceiling once we reach approximately 60 big blind stacks. And by the time we hit 80 big blinds, there's almost no change no matter how deep we get. This represents a saturation point for the big blind's positional advantage, where they can only leverage the benefit of position up to a certain point. Just because they're, say, 200 big blinds deep doesn't mean they can just force the small blind off a massive portion of their equity. The small blind still gets to have strong hands sometimes, and those strong hands can't be made to fold just because stacks are deep. This is especially true in limped pots, where the big blind will usually have a weaker range than the small blind, and is therefore often going to struggle to take aggressive lines at a high frequency on many board textures. As a result of this overall dynamic, you'll see that a lot of the strategies for 80 big blind stacks look extremely similar to the ones for any stack size above that level, making it a little easier for us to build deep stacked preflop strategies for these spots. Another thing we need to consider about blind versus blind spots is that the raise sizings we'll be using from both positions are much larger than in other situations, and for slightly different reasons in each case. From the small blind, a small raise, for example, our usual two big blinds or 2.2 big blinds would achieve very little fold equity, given that the big blind would be getting an extremely good price to call and realize equity with many hands. In fact, even if we go bigger, we're still much more likely to face a call than to face a three bet. And this basic reality means that the top of our range has a strong desire to grow the pot by raising larger to three or 3.5 big blinds or even bigger when stacks are deep. In addition, raising to a larger size helps to shrink the post-flop stack to pot ratio at a faster rate which is favorable when we're guaranteed to be out of position. So in general, the only times when we can tolerate raising a little smaller from the small blind are when stacks are shallow enough that the post-flop SPR will be low anyway, or when post-flop play is less likely to happen in the first place for ICM reasons. From the big blind, we also prefer to raise larger versus a limp, simply because there's already a lot in the pot, and raising small would mean that the small blind gets to realize equity with a large portion of their limping range something that isn't especially favorable when our own range is very wide. On top of this, the small blind's limping range is generally not particularly strong, meaning an aggressive response in the form of a limp re-raise is relatively unlikely. Once again, this means the top of our range has a strong desire to start building the pot at a faster rate to get value from the calls in the small blind's range. Overall, we'll find that both players' raising ranges will usually contain some element of polarization, consistent with using a larger sizing, while the limping or checking ranges will often be somewhat condensed to middle strength or weaker hands, but with some element of protection in there as well. 
You'll see what I mean by these two things as we start to break down the ranges. The third theoretical principle we need to keep in mind is that simplifying strategies in these spots is somewhat difficult. It's not easy to simply implement a limp all or a raise all strategy preflop or a range bet or range check strategy postflop because the ranges are so wide to begin with. They contain a lot of different categories of hands, all with different incentives. The top of our range wants to get value, the bottom wants to bluff, and the middle wants to realize equity. But when each of these categories contains several hundred possible combinations of hands, balancing them all against each other is very difficult. Splitting our ranges, mixing our frequencies, and all these other things that we might often do in spots where our range doesn't contain quite so many hands are going to be more difficult in blind versus blind spots. So we have to start out with a clear perspective on what our strategic incentives are. Finally, another key thing to remember is that blind versus blind play is actually one of the most common individual positional formations in tournament play. In a GTO scenario, action folds to the small blind somewhere between roughly 7% and 13% of the time if action is nine-handed. These numbers go up rapidly as we remove players from the table. So as we progress deeper into a tournament, short-handed play will increase the proportion of hands played blind versus blind. In addition, ICM spots will demand everybody folds slightly more often than in chip EV, and removing multiple players from the table to create a four-handed or five-handed spot could easily put us in a situation where the overall frequency that action folds to the small blind is greater than 30%. It's hard to find other specific formations which are replicated with this kind of significant frequency. Clearly, blind versus blind is an important part of tournament poker play. So with all of this in mind, let's move on to introducing our primary methodology for this video, what I've called pivot points. This isn't really a pre-existing term, it's just something I've applied for this analysis, so let me tell you what I mean by this. A pivot point is a specific stack size at which our overall strategy at a certain node changes in a noticeable way. This could include any type of change, such as adding or removing specific bet sizes, changing initial preferred actions such as switching from raising to limping, altering our frequencies, or adapting the overall construction and makeup of our ranges. You'll see plenty of examples of this over the course of this video, with the most significant probably being the introduction or removal of certain all-in or non-all-in raising ranges at different stacks. Obviously, there are certain stack thresholds above or below which certain options aren't viable, and we'll establish those thresholds later on. Let's now move on to looking at our first key node, the unopened small blind node. This is possibly the most important node of the blind versus blind game trees, since it's the one which occurs far more often than any other, and all the subsequent nodes we're going to look at in this video are simply a product of the small blind strategy when it folds around to them. To begin, let's break down this graphic showing the evolution of the small blinds unopened strategy at all the stack sizes from 7 big blinds up to 200 big blinds in a 9-handed game. The first thing to note is that virtually all stack sizes have more limping than raising. In fact, Limping is by far the dominant action here at most stacks. The limping frequency, the green region here, is very consistent at all stack sizes from 80 big blinds upwards, which links very closely to what we talked about earlier with regard to the big blind's edge becoming saturated. Once we hit that saturation point, limping becomes a very good strategy for the small blind because there's only so much the big blind can reasonably do to apply pressure to the small blind's limping range. This is why a lot of our small blind strategies at deep stacks look the way they do. People tend to assume deeper stacks feature more raising, but in reality that's not the case. In reality, raising becomes more prevalent between around 25 and 50 big blinds, peaking at around 35 big blinds, but still never coming close to surpassing limping as the foundation of our strategy. You'll note also that the small blind's folding frequency is very consistent at all stacks. It only goes above 20% once we're sub-15 big blinds, and it stays at around 10% from 60 big blinds upwards. This speaks to one very common leak in MTT players, simply folding too much in these spots. Playing only 60-70% to of hands here would be giving up a lot of EV to the big blind. With this graph, we can establish fairly easily what our pivot points are we can identify three specific stack sizes at which the small blind strategy shifts quite significantly. These stacks are roughly 70 big blinds, 35 big blinds, and 18 big blinds. Conveniently, each is roughly half of the next. Let's take a look at some of our strategies as we pass these pivot points and identify where the shifts in our approach are occurring. First, here's our strategy for 200 big blinds compared to 80 big blinds to illustrate how these two stack sizes are actually virtually identical in terms of how we should approach them. In both of these spots, we're folding only the weakest offsuit hands, roughly the bottom 10% of the deck, and our non-folding range is very clearly delineated. We have a polarized raising range, primarily consisting of some of the strongest and weakest suited hands at higher frequencies, along with some slightly less trashy offsuit hands at lower frequencies, with a lot of our most playable categories of hands, like suited connectors and pairs, also mixing both options. Our limping range is wide and slightly more condensed, 
with fours through deuces always limping, along with some of the middling and weaker suited hands, and some weak offsuit hands. Most hands are limping more often than they're raising, with the exception of the suited Broadway region. Once we pass that first 70 big blind pivot point though, our strategy starts to shift significantly. Take a look at this comparison between 100 big blinds and 50 big blinds to see what I mean. At 50 big blinds, we're folding very slightly more often, and our raising range is staying polarized, this is a common trend as you'll see, but we're now heavily favoring raising with most of the strongest suited hands, and many of the middling offsuit combos are now raising at a much higher rate as well. Our limping range has stayed relatively consistent in terms of its construction, with two specific categories of hands now essentially playing pure limp. The suited high cards, such as king deuce suited through king six suited, queen deuce suited through queen eight suited, and jack four suited through jack seven suited. This speaks to our desire to have hands in our limping range which can realize equity quite efficiently, even if they're not strong enough to raise and get called by worse. We're also pure limping the portion of the deck that's just above our folding range. A lot of the weakest offsuit hands. These hands are primarily limping with intent to fold to a raise, and they don't even have enough post-flop playability or blocking power for us to raise them at any frequency. Next, let's compare 50 big blinds with 25 big blinds, crossing over our next pivot point, which was at the 35 big blind stack size. The previous trends have been amplified even further here, and we now have an all-in shoving range on top of our raising range. We're still folding at roughly the same frequency, and those small pairs and middling offsuit aces are favoring the all-in ahead of anything else. Our raising range has actually become more polarized because we're now forced to remove any hands which would be indifferent versus an all-in shove at 25 big blinds. Hands like the weaker suited aces, queen 10 suited, king 9 suited and others are now limping, because they're neither strong enough to comfortably raise call, nor weak enough to justifiably raise fold. Our limping range is also a little more protected at this stack size, with those suited aces and some stronger offsuit aces serving as some of our limp jams, which we'll discuss later. Essentially, because we're shallow enough that our opponent can theoretically justify just jamming over our limp, we now have a little more incentive to trap with some stronger hands, which also serves to protect the bottom of our limping range a little more. Finally, when we pass through that 18 big blind pivot point and compare 25 big blinds to 12 big blind stacks, it's clear that our non-all-in raising range has virtually disappeared and been replaced by a shoving range. This is the primary adaptation which occurs when we cross that pivot point. We're folding a little more often and playing more or less a limp or jam strategy, and our construction is a little unusual in that our limping range is actually somewhat polarized, a rare example of taking a passive action with a polarized range. The reason is because we're anticipating the big blind jamming over our limp at a high rate. We're only limping with hands which can snap call or snap fold if that happens. There are only a handful of combos like jack eight suited or king five suited, which are reluctantly calling off due to pot odds. Everything else is a snap call or a snap fold. Our all in shoving range on the other hand is now somewhat condensed. We're jamming a lot of hands which have good equity when called, but aren't strong enough to trap or weak enough to fold. We're prioritizing a lot of the suited 7x hands and offsuit kings as the cutoff point for our jamming range, because the stronger suited hands are now limping to trap, and they have so much equity to realize in limped pots that they play very well when it goes limp check. So let's summarize the strategic changes we're making at each pivot point here. Above 70 big blinds, so before we hit our first pivot point, we're limping a wide range and raising a polarized range at a low frequency. As we go below 70 big blinds and approach 35 big blinds, we're increasing our propensity to raise and prioritizing the strongest suited hands when we do so. Once we dip below 35 big blinds, we're likely to start open jamming some hands while protecting our limping range a little more. And finally, once we get below 18 big blinds, we stop raising to a non all in size and switch to a limp or jam strategy with a polarized limping range and a condensed jamming range. Now, before we finish up looking at the small blind unopened node, let's take a look at how ICM might impact this node. I've pinpointed two fairly extreme scenarios in the GTO Wizard archive, where the small blind either has a significant risk advantage or a significant disadvantage. In this first one, it's a six-handed final table spot where the small blind has a huge risk advantage of 12.9% over the big blind, at 42 big blind effective stacks. Here, the small blind's risk advantage means the big blind has to fold a disproportionately high number of hands versus a raise, so the limping option becomes almost irrelevant in this case. The small blind is essentially playing raise or fold and could easily justify removing limping from their strategy entirely here. By contrast, take a look at this next spot where the small blind has a significant risk disadvantage, this time at 62 big blinds effective, with the big blind being the chip leader at a final table and having a 13.8% risk advantage over the small blind. In this case, the small blind is forced to fold a lot more often, even beginning to muck some suited hands for fear of the big blind's aggression. 
while there's almost no raising range at all. The small blind has no desire to play bloated pots anymore, and there's also a huge incentive to make sure the limping range is protected here, since it would be very vulnerable to aggression if it weren't. We can see from these two examples that significant ICM pressure causes the small blind to shift heavily towards either a more aggressive raising strategy or a more protected limping strategy, depending on the circumstances. Obviously, the extent of ICM pressure and risk advantage won't always be this extreme, but if we know where the boundaries are, we can adjust more effectively when the impact of ICM isn't quite so drastic. Next, let's move on to our second key node, the big blind's response versus a small blind limp. As you can see from this first graph, this node is very different from the small blind unopened node. There are fewer pivot points in play. In fact, there's really only one pivot point at around 28 big blinds. You could make the argument that another pivot point exists somewhere else, perhaps at around 60 to 65 big blinds, but the changes to the big blinds frequencies really aren't significant until we start to get to those shallower stack regions. So I think it's easier to just use one pivot point for this node. The reason for this is, in large part, because the big blind strategy at this node is dependent upon the small blind's limping strategy. The small blind is always limping with the intent to keep the big blind indifferent between raising and checking with as much of their range as possible. So it's natural that there's no specific stack size where raising becomes much better or much worse for the big blind. The 28 big blind pivot point is approximately the point where jamming all in becomes a viable option for the big blind versus a limp. And that's what makes it a pivot point here. It's not necessarily that the small blind's approach becomes drastically different, it's just that the stacks are shallow enough that the big blind is getting a slightly better price to jam and potentially win the roughly three big blind starting pot. Let's compare the big blind strategy at two wildly different stack sizes, 200 big blinds and 40 big blinds, to illustrate the similarities we're seeing across the stacks here. As you can see, the two approaches look very close here. In both instances, the big blind is raising a wide range, although as stacks get a bit shallower, they're shifting a little bit more in favor of offsuit trashy bluffs instead of suited ones. Another common trend is that the big blind's checking range isn't really protected to any extent at either stack size. They're never checking back strong hands here. In fact, they're barely checking back any of the top 20 to 25% of the deck, let alone strong hands. This is simply because limped pots don't contribute a significant amount to the big blind's EV here. So it's much more important to simply maximize their EV in raised pots. And it's also because even on some of the absolute worst boards for the big blind in a limped pot, usually a double broadway or triple broadway flop, they can still have some amount of two pair combos or straights, which can protect their range from enduring massive amounts of pressure from the small blind. If we look at a comparison between 40 big blinds and 20 big blinds though, you'll see a much more stark contrast between the two stacks. As we pass below that 28 big blind pivot point, we now have an all-in jamming range versus a limp, and that range looks very similar to the range which the small blind was open jamming at similar stacks. It's very heavy on the smallest pocket pairs and offsuit ace hands both of which have decent equity when called, but which realize equity poorly when playing post-flop. The big blind's raising range versus the limp is now extremely polarized, since it's now important for the big blind to protect their raising range versus a limp jam. They're only raising hands which have a clear call or a clear fold versus the jam. In this case, that means never raising as a bluff with a suited hand. The bluffing region here is exclusively composed of offsuit combos. In particular, some of the absolute weakest offsuit hands in the deck are bluffing at moderately high frequencies here. In particular, the ones which contain a deuce 3 or 4 with a high to middle card kicker. The strongest suited hands which are in a close spot if they get jammed on, like ace 6 suited, king 8 suited, and queen 10 suited, are heavily preferring to just check back instead of raising and being indifferent versus a jam. This node is a little simpler to summarize than the previous one. In this case, when we're above 28 big blinds, we have a high raise frequency versus a limp, with a polarized raising range which leans on offsuit bluffs at most stacks, but includes a few suited bluffs once we get deeper. Below 28 big blinds, we start jamming over a limp at some frequency, while our raising range becomes heavily polarized to combat the limp jam, with our bluffing combos coming from the weakest offsuit hands, and our value hands being very happy to call a limp jam. To address the impact of ICM on this node, let's keep the same set of sims as we were looking at before, starting with the spot where the big blind has a huge risk advantage at 62 big blind stacks. Interestingly, this spot hasn't altered significantly compared to what we saw in Chip EV. It's more aggressive overall, particularly with the bluffing portion of range, but it's not constructed in a different way. The small blind in this spot was limping a much more protected range, so while the big blind does still get to attack their limp fairly aggressively, they can't go overboard, and they still don't have much incentive to raise with medium strength suited hands which might prefer to just check. Interestingly, if we swap things around and give the big blind a significant risk disadvantage, a couple of things do occur. A very small frequency of jams start to emerge, along with some much larger raises to 7 big blinds instead of 3.5 big blinds. The bluffing portion of the range is also much more content to check back instead of raising. 
However, this range is less worthy of in-depth examination because as we saw previously, in this spot where the small blind has a huge risk advantage, the small blind is essentially supposed to play a pure raise strategy instead of limping, so it's ultimately not that important for the big blind to know how to play against the limp. But it is interesting that jamming and raising larger become a possibility when we're more preoccupied with simply taking pots down preflop against the chip leader. Next, let's move on to a more complex node of the tree. The small blind's response versus a raise after they limp. Obviously, there's a reason we looked at the small blind unopened node before this one, since this node is dependent on the small blind having limped to begin with. We should keep in mind what the small blind's unopened strategy looks like when we're analyzing this node. For this node, we have three pivot points at roughly 80 big blinds, 40 big blinds, and 25 big blinds. For the purposes of analyzing our strategies here, I'm going to adapt our view of the sims to show the hand combos at full height, just so we can see them more clearly. But keep in mind when you see these ranges that not all the hands within the ranges are limping first in at high frequencies. Let's start with deep stacks again, in this case comparing 200 big blinds with 100 big blinds. As you can see, the strategies are very similar. The only major difference here is that the 200 big blind spot requires the small blind to limp 3-bet with a slightly more linear range, including some suited hands instead of the offsuit aces you can see on the right. But overall, the value 3-bet range is consistent, and so are most of the calls and folds. We're prioritizing two things in the limp 3-bet range, board coverage and blocking power. The suited connectors are providing the coverage, while the offsuit aces provide the blocking power. It's notable also that the pocket pairs don't function well as limp 3-bets. Even pocket 9s and pocket 8s are mostly just limp calling. It's also notable that the small blind is limp calling some hands as weak as jack deuce suited or king 7 off here. These might seem way too weak to call a large raise, but the bottom line here is that the big blind's raising range is very wide and very polarized, so the small blind has more equity with these hands than it might seem like they do. Next, let's compare 100 big blinds with 60 big blinds, passing that first 80 big blind pivot point. There's a very clear shift here, which is easily observable. At 60 big blinds, the small blind is no longer limp 3-bet bluffing with any suited hands. The suited connectors have disappeared from the range, indicating that board coverage is no longer particularly important, while some offsuit hands have started bluffing where they weren't before. The bottom of the small blind's limping range is still purely folding, but the limp 3-bet range has changed dramatically. These offsuit high card hands are now our bluffs. In addition, the slightly shallower stacks mean that we're able to limp call with almost any suited hand which limped in the first place, while pairs like 9s and 8s are now slightly more willing to limp 3-bet in order to play for stacks. If we drop the stacks to 30 big blinds, crossing over that second 40 big blind pivot point, we can now see that a limp jamming range becomes a big part of our strategy. Pocket pairs up to 9s, and a lot of the strongest and weakest offsuit aces are forming the foundation of our range. Once again, our jamming range is composed of those two hand categories here. What's also notable here is that the range for limp raising to a non-all-in size isn't containing very many obvious bluffs, or at least it looks that way. The reason is because the value range is very narrow to begin with. While all the pocket pairs, 10s plus, and the strongest suited aces are limp raising small if they do limp in the first place, they're not limping that often at these stacks. So this is actually a very low frequency play. We're mostly limp jamming, limp calling, or limp folding here. Once we get below the final pivot point of 25 big blinds, we can see from this 15 big blind example that we have no room to limp raise small anymore. We're just playing jam, call, or fold. We're actually trapping with jacks plus to protect our other limp calls, while pairs like sixes through tens need a bit of protection, so they prefer to jam. Fives through deuces didn't limp in the first place, they just jammed all in, so they're not in the range here. Our suited ace hands also prefer to limp jam, even though they play fairly well as limp calls. They just have very good equity when called, plus good blocking power. We're also limp jamming a small frequency with some of the suited queens and some other middle suited hands, but again, these hands aren't limping that often to begin with at this stack they were open jamming a lot instead. To summarize our overall approach at this node, when we're deep stacked above 80 big blinds, we're limp 3-betting with a more diverse range which possesses good board coverage and includes some suited connectors. As we get shallower, those suited hands disappear from our bluffing range and are replaced by a lot of offsuit ace x hands and other bluffs. Below 40 big blinds, we start limp jamming some hands, mostly pairs and offsuit aces, while we begin to trap a bit more readily with jacks plus as we start to get shallower and shallower, and limp jamming with a wider range becomes a more attractive proposition. The impact of ICM at this node is very interesting. If we look first at our risk advantage example, it's important to remember that the small blind wasn't limping a lot here in the first place, so this node is slightly less reliable as a result. However, in theory, the same principles are still applying. We're limp raising a very polarized range here at 42 big blinds, and we haven't yet arrived at the point where limp jamming is a big part of our strategy. Our offsuit bluffing hands are even weaker than they were in chip EV. The offsuit aces are now almost too strong to use as bluffs, but we're still bluffing at a good rate, 
and our value range is restricted to Ace Jack Plus and Pocket Nines Plus, since the big blind won't be jamming over our limp 3 bet with a wide range. With a risk disadvantage, some very interesting things happen. Remember that as the small blind in this spot, we were essentially employing a pure limp strategy at the unopened node. And our high risk premium with the 62 big blind stack against the chip leader is exerting a big influence here. We're actually limp jamming some hands, although it's a very blocker heavy range of mostly ace 10 offsuit through ace king offsuit. And we're still 3 bet bluffing with mostly those offsuit ace combos. But the biggest difference is our limp 3 bet value range. It's only kings plus and ace king suited. Even queens and jacks are forced to just limp call here because getting it all in against the big blind would be so damaging in this spot. And there are so many awkward spots which can happen if we limp 3-bet. In addition, many low card hands like deuces and 5-4 suited are forced to fold at some frequency, even if they seemingly have good equity versus the raising range, since they're going to really struggle to realize that equity in a post-flop spot. We're folding hands as strong as queen 10 off, ace 8 off, and king 3 suited here as well, so it's clearly not a spot where we want to put ourselves in a lot of limp call situations. Next, let's move on to our final key preflop node, the node where the big blind defends against a raise from the small blind. We saw beforehand that raising from the small blind was occurring at a reasonable frequency at all stacks, so it's important that we know how to defend against it. Interestingly, our pivot points for this node are the same as the ones for when we're in the small blind facing a big blind raise after limping most likely because the SPR is roughly the same at each of these two nodes. There is a significant change in the big blind strategy at the 40 big blind mark, but this is because the small blinds raise size changes, from 3.5 big blinds down to 3 big blinds in most of our sims. That results in the big blind getting a much better price, and forces the big blind to defend a fair amount wider. You'll see that this change in sizing is fairly often reflected in how people actually play, which is convenient for us in implementing these strategies. If we look first at our defense strategy for deep stacks, we can see there's a similar alteration to what we observed before, between 200 big blind and 100 big blind stacks. The 200 big blind sim requires a little bit more in the way of board coverage and suited bluffs in our 3-bet range than the 100 big blind version does, but otherwise the two are very similar. The reason why the calling range is actually wider in the 100 big blind version is because the open size goes down from 4 big blinds at 200 to 3.5 big blinds at 100. Our 3-bet value range is consistent across both sims at roughly jacks plus, ace-jack suited plus, and ace-queen off. Note how important it is for us to have high card value and be able to dominate our opponent's raise calls. If we scale down the stacks and look at 100 big blinds compared to 50 big blinds, the effect of that 80 big blind pivot point is fairly clear when we look at the suited connector region. We no longer have much need for any significant amount of board coverage in our 3-bet range. The suited connectors are almost always just calling at 50 big blinds, while they're mixing a lot of 3-bets at 100. The rest of our 3-bet bluffs are coming from the offsuit side of the deck, and that's staying pretty consistent between the two stacks, as is our value 3-bet range and our tendency to virtually never fold a suited hand. When we drop from 50 big blinds down to 30 big blinds, a lot starts to change. We now have both a 3-bet jamming range and a non-all-in 3-bet range, the former of which is constructed in a very familiar way, containing mostly small pairs and offsuit aces. We're also now starting to trap with kings plus at some rate, to protect what is now a fairly weak calling range, and because we can still easily stack off with these hands post-flop on most boards. As before, our 3-bet bluffs are coming from the offsuit region, so this is very consistent across stack sizes. We're not 3-bet bluffing with suited hands here. In particular, the high card, low card combos are our best candidates, since they block some raised calls and unblock a lot of raised folds while our calling range is actually a little wider than it was before since the raise size is now smaller at 3 big blinds instead of 3.5. Once we compare 30 big blinds to 20 big blinds, we can see the impact of the 25 big blind pivot point. We're no longer 3-betting to a non-all-in size. Our jamming range is heavily composed of low pairs and offsuit aces now, almost exclusively in fact, with some of the strongest suited aces also jamming for pure value. We no longer have to worry about constructing a 3-bet bluff range, it's just an all-in. However, one very interesting factor is that because our opponent's raising range doesn't contain a lot of lower pocket pairs, since they prefer to either open jam or limp jam them, we're actually preferring to trap by calling with pairs 7s and up. This seems a bit unconventional, but it really just comes down to the fact that it's hard for us to actually get called by worse hands when we jam them. We just make the small blind fold all their low equity offsuit bluff raises, which is less favorable than forcing them to play those hands post flop out of position. To summarize our overall approach at this node, it looks a lot like the small blind's approach to defending against a raise. 
At deeper stacks, our three bet range needs some board coverage, but not a ton. We're still primarily three bet bluffing with offsuit hands. As we get shallower, we move away from wanting board coverage in our three bets and towards prioritizing blockers, while we begin jamming small pairs and some offsuit aces as we hit the second pivot point. Once we get even shallower, we continue jamming at a high rate, but we now start to benefit from calling and playing post-flop with hands like sevens and king-queen suited, since the villain's raising range is very polarized. The impact of ICM here is a little like what we might expect. In the first spot where the big blind has a big risk advantage, the small blind isn't raising many hands to begin with. Remember that almost pure limp strategy we saw before. But if they do, then the big blind gets to punish them with a lot of weaker offsuit 3-bet bluffs, and their value 3-bet range narrows to mostly queens plus and ace-queen suited plus. If the big blind has a big risk disadvantage versus a small blind who's open raising a very wide range, then some of the same trends are visible, like the jams creeping in a little more readily even at 42 big blinds, while the value range stays relatively consistent. The small blind is more able to 4-bet jam with a wider range, so hands like ace-jack suited are still strong enough to be willing to get it in here. The 3-bet bluffing range is not that far away from chippy v here because the impact of the small blind being able to raise a wider range preflop and then 4-bet jam a wider range as well is enough to offset the risk premium imposed on the big blind to some degree. If the small blind were to play a normal chippy v strategy here, the big blind would be forced to tighten up a fair bit. So this concludes our fairly comprehensive preflop analysis. Let's move on to a brief overview of how some of the most important flop nodes operate. In this case, we're going to be focusing on the small blind strategy in limped pots, the small blind strategy in raised pots, and then the big blind strategy in raised pots. These are the most common nodes in this portion of the post-flop tree. First, a breakdown of the small blind's flop strategy in limped pots. As you can see here, there's an interesting trend regarding the small blind's aggression. They're betting flops less than half the time overall in limped pots, but in particular, they're doing it even less often at the stack sizes where the small blind's preflop strategy was more centered around raising with a lot of their strongest hands. This makes sense, since the small blind's range in a limped pot at these stack sizes will be weaker overall. In general, the small blind is rarely using any kind of large bet sizings, mostly because there's a very limited degree of asymmetry between the ranges which they can leverage. They have a very wide range, and so does the big blind. So small bets are by far the most common option on the flop. This does alter a little as stacks get shallower, but that's mostly because the big blind's checking behind range is getting weaker overall. To analyze overall board textures, I've used 50 big blinds as an example since it's a middling stack size. There are a few clear trends here. The triple boards are the best ones for the small blind, with the connected and monotone ones being the worst. It doesn't seem to matter much whether the board is paired or unpaired, or whether it's rainbow or contains a flush draw. Other factors matter more, as we'll see in a moment. This is a breakdown of the strategy according to the flop high card at 50 big blinds. There's a very obvious trend here. The lower card boards are significantly less favorable for the small blind, to the point where the triple wheel boards are almost pure checks. When we combine this somewhat linear scale with the insight from the previous graphic, it's clear that a board which is, say, 9 high and monotone, or 8 high and connected, should have very little betting, while an ace-high disconnected board might be a little more favorable. All of which is very logical if you're familiar with how conventional flop continuation bet construction usually works. In general, the small blind strategy in limped pots will be very passive overall, with very little large betting on the flop, and a sub-50% frequency of small betting. It gets even more passive at middling stack sizes between 25 to 40 big blinds, because the small blind's limping range weakens and the big blind's checking back range becomes a little stronger. We should be the most wary on the monotone and connected boards, especially if the board is all low cards, while ace and king high disconnected boards do allow for a bit more betting. All in all, our strategy is relatively straightforward up to a point. If we move on to looking at the small blind strategy in raised pots, there are a few obvious differences we'll notice right away. First of all, the trend of being more passive at middle stacks disappears. We're able to be quite aggressive in raised pots at all stacks. In fact, we become more aggressive as stacks get shallower, in a fairly linear way. This is just because as stack to pot ratio gets lower, we become more focused on denying equity to the big blind when we're out of position. It's also noteworthy here that the small blind does quite a lot of big betting, including a lot of overbetting at deeper stacks. This does disappear once we're below 30 big blinds, but the medium and large bets are still prevalent at this stack size, and indeed at many stacks below 30 big blinds as well. This is reflective of our much stronger range in raised pots, and the fact that we do possess a nut advantage on many boards. The same trends as before are visible when it comes to texture, with the exception that paired boards are now pretty good for the razor. Otherwise, everything stays more or less identical to what it was in limped pots.
This is also broadly true for the flop's high card, although with the slight caveat that ace and king high boards are not quite as good for the raiser as they could be. In fact, queen high boards are the best ones, which is perhaps a little surprising, but makes sense when we consider that the offsuit queen x hands will often be folded by the big blind to the preflop raise, while the offsuit king x and ace x hands will mostly call or three bet. In summary, we're doing a lot more c betting in raised pots as stacks get shallower, since the c bet itself has a greater proportional impact on SPR across multiple streets, and equity denial matters more as we get shorter. We're also attacking the paired, disconnected, and rainbow boards more aggressively, since they're a lot better for our range now. We're using a good amount of big bets on some of the middle card disconnected boards, including some overbets at deeper stacks. And finally, we should be careful not to go overboard on ace or king high flops, since those are still decent boards for the big blind caller in many instances. To wrap up this video, let's end by switching to the big blind's perspective and looking at the big blind's c-bet strategy after the small blind limp calls. Note in this case that the small blind will have some donk bets on certain boards, and we're not accounting for that. If we removed the small blind donk bet, then the big blind's overall strategy would likely become more passive overall. As you can see, the trend of being more aggressive at shallower stacks is still present in a fairly linear way. The most surprising part of the equation here is that we're still forced to check almost half the time at deeper stacks. Even though we possess a significant positional advantage, the small blinds range is protected enough that we have to be somewhat cautious on many flops. When it comes to texture, we see exactly the same trends here as we did before. More betting on rainbow, disconnected, and paired or tripled textures, and less betting on monotone, connected, or unpaired flops. The reasons for this are the same as they were before. These boards are more favorable for the preflop raises range overall. Lastly, if we sort by high card, we see a slightly different trend. Our frequency on any board with an 8 or higher stays relatively consistent, while the lower card boards are actually the ones which we get to pressure more aggressively. This would be a byproduct of the fact that the small blind very rarely has overpairs in the limp call line at this stack size, while they also don't have very many of the offsuit low card combos which make two pairs or straights. The big blind gets to pressure these boards relatively aggressively, while on any other type of board texture, the small blind will have enough top pairs that they can defend relatively well against a c-bet from the big blind. The lack of overpairs hurts the small blind a fair amount here. Hands like 8s plus are mostly jamming or 3-betting after they limp pre-flop. To sum up, we see the big blind once again doing more c-betting as stacks get shallower, with primarily smaller sizings, but some big bets also appearing. The overbets disappear once they get below 40 big blinds, but the large and medium bets still happen a lot. The same monotone and connected boards are the ones to watch out for, but this time we're able to attack the low card boards a bit more aggressively, since the small blind almost never has an overpair on these boards. And so finally we've reached the end of this video. Thanks everyone for sticking with me the whole way through. If you have any questions, please feel free to message me via the GTO Wizard Discord server and I will do my best to answer them. I will be back with another video soon, and in the meantime, good luck everybody, and thanks again for watching.